on today's show. And so to see that their perspective and to actually demonstrate with so much patience and love, the love of Christ, because yeah. that's what we're seeing we've encountered. That's what I encountered. Yeah. I remember telling my dad, I have encountered a Jesus who's alive. Well, welcome to 700 Club Canada today. And thank you so much for joining us. And you're gonna really love this episode because today we're talking about grace. Yeah, what do you think about grace, Bill? Do you have any grace in your life? <laughs> well, I, my wife has a lot of grace. She's married <laughs> to me, but, but I have this great story. I always think when I think of grace, uh, when I was a little kid, of course, I grew up in Thailand and we were crossing a street and it was incredibly busy. And my dad asked me to hold his hand, but by that time I was, I think I was eight years old. So yeah. I thought I was pretty much a man. Yeah. <laughs> so I refused that kind gesture. Oh, and as no. a result, I got actually hit by a motorcycle. What? Yeah, yeah, I, I got hit by a motorcycle. Wow. So I'm laying on the ground crying. I kind of deserved it. I mean, I know that sounds harsh, but I really did because I didn't listen. Children obey your parents. Exactly. And then I remember this big shadow because my dad's a large man. He overshadowed me. And in that moment, he picked me up. And I was afraid of retribution. I, I was afraid that I was going to get a scolding. I probably deserved it. Yeah. But instead, he just took me to the side of the road and said, are you okay? Wow. And I think of that every time I think of God's grace, that yeah. we don't always listen to him. Sometimes we have to experience the consequences of that, and yet he's always there for us and loves us. That is grace. Oh, I love that so <laughs> much because you know what? So often we think like we got in trouble. We didn't obey, right? Yeah. Daddy's just going to deal with us. And so today, they, may this be a reminder to you, we're going to talk about grace, and you're going to meet Anne Miranda. She's going to tell her story of grace up next. Well, welcome, Anne Miranda, back to 700 Club Canada. Thanks for being with us. Thank you, Lori. This is such a delight. Well, you are the pastor of Women's Ministries at Village Church in Surrey, B.C., doing a fantastic job, I have to say. But it's something that you never would have dreamed of as a young girl. Tell us a little of your faith story and how you came to follow Jesus. Oh, never. I would have never dreamt that I would be doing what I'm doing right, right? now. Uh, my goodness, my trajectory was really uh, about social justice and education. And so I was working for the Attorney General's office here in British Columbia. I was studying education in university and I received, you know, an invitation. In the midst of all that, I thought I was just living life to the fullest, partying, doing my thing as a young adult, yeah. and uh, thinking I had my life all together. But uh, this invitation was basically more like a pestering. It was like, come to church, come to church, come to church. And so after, I don't know how many times, I just picked up the, uh, this one phone call and I said, listen, I'll go with you on one condition. I will never talk to you again. <laughs> and uh, I don't ever want you to call me again after oh this. My. And some people think the guy wasn't a guy. It was just this, this gal that I know. Okay. And so she, as we went to church, um, I had this incredible supernatural encounter there at, at, at this little church in Surrey and was totally blown away. My life completely was impacted by this message of Jesus. And that person actually upheld their side of the agreement. And so I was solo for two years, going to church by myself, learning how to read the Bible by myself. I didn't know how to get plugged in, you know, mentored, small group. I didn't know any of that stuff. That language was foreign to me. Got wow. baptized by myself. Nobody was there with me, none of that. And that was my journey. But after the two year mark, um, I just became more more bold and public mm -hmm. with my faith and uh, had to have some really tough conversations with my family. That's incredible. I mean, wow, kudos to that person that pestered you, right? Like, who knows what our invitation might do? But you were raised in a traditional Lebanese family with parents that had immigrated to Canada from Lebanon. What was your experience like growing up then? Uh, so a lot of food. 
<laughs> but really good food. Really good food. <laughs> the house food. always smelled amazing. Yeah. Um, and uh, I, I think we say traditional. Everybody has different and a different idea of what that looked like. Uh, for me, it was to stay true to roots, to try um, as much as possible to preserve culture. Oddly enough, when we were growing up, so I was born and raised in Ottawa, uh, Ontario, and then. Um, and then we moved to Edmonton, Alberta, and then to wow. British Columbia. Wow. So I kind of feel like I'm a real Canadian yeah. girl all the way across the right. country. Right. Uh, in my home, it was more of my dad, actually, that was so open to mm. education, open to uh, supporting me and empowering me to reach my dreams and my goals. Mm -hmm. He was also an educated man. So he was like, look, what do you want to study? Uh, I think the values that were very hard, driven very hard were family yeah. is important. Education is important. And it is a privilege to live in Canada. So right. better work your butt off. Because right. This is a awesome place to live right place make this prime. Lebanese family proud right and and you were the yeah. first Christian in your household and the first person to marry interculturally in your family you're a troublemaker aren't you Anne what were the <laughs> challenges that came with that I I think I would call myself more like a, a tradition maker okay, <laughs> okay. I, like maker. I like it I like it I like it making some new traditions you know it was really hard I'm making light of it uh, but I it was really difficult because I was I was viewed as this breaking tradition mm -hmm. and we don't do change well oh now I'm going to a new church and and a new set of beliefs and now I'm marrying someone and that is from a different culture and they thought I was going to maintain traditions uh, and so so that brings up a lot of uh, tension and yeah. a feeling of betrayal mm -hmm. because I'm trying to put myself in my parents' shoes coming sure. here, um, sure. starting off a new life. They are both immigrants. They weren't refugees. So they were also coming here with an educated background, wanting to work hard and right. bless you know their family and mm -hmm. all of that. And here, their firstborn, because I have that as well, right. is, is uh, changing things on them. Mm -hmm. So it was difficult but we've had lots of conversations and I think the turning point was when my dad had cancer actually mm -hmm. and we were able to uh count he was able to just open his heart to a lot of faith conversations right. what would you uh, and that yeah. softened everyone's hearts what would you say to even people watching now like briefly but there's so many watching that this is probably their story their parents maybe immigrated to Canada and you know, maybe they've chosen to follow Jesus and it's not the tradition of their family. What would you say in encouragement to them? Yeah, I think the first part, and I wish, you know, there are some things I wish I did differently. And one of them would be to not view the, uh, my parents as wrong. Okay. And I think that that, that puts attention in uh, just to, to start off with. And so to see the, their perspective Right. And to actually demonstrate with so much patience and love, the love of Christ, because yeah. that's what we're seeing we've encountered. That's what I encountered. Yeah. I remember telling my dad, I have encountered a Jesus who's alive. Right. He's not on some crucifix. He's not you know, in a grave. He's a Jesus that's alive. I want that. And I want you to experience that power mm. that I have now experienced. And mm. I want to learn about him and his ways and so that passion that you feel as that new believer that your eyes are like open to something different mm -hmm. that you haven't experienced before mm -hmm. I think we take that with so much love and patience and try to share that in our actions more than our words that's a really good word I think it's all about grace right God showed us grace and we in many ways can show grace to others even though we've taken a different path and uh, really love draws them. I love that. That's so good. Thank you. You know, you recently hosted an online women's conference and you saw record numbers registered. Over 4,000 women, and come on, from around the world. Was this a surprise to you? And what is this a sign of possible revival in Canada? Like, what do you see in all of this? I think it's, yes, it should be. It should be surprising yet because it's not a work of our hands or our, our you know, human hands. It's the, definitely the breath of God that 
moving across this country. I think that it reminded me of Philippians because our topic was joy and how we're on this pursuit of joy in our lifetime. And we're trying to fill this void with everything else but Jesus. Uh, And so it reminded me of like Paul's in quarantine, isolation, prison, yet the gospel's advancing more than ever before in that area. And Christians are uniting and being mobilized in their faith. And that's what happened. That's what I'm seeing across the country in men and women, just Mm -hmm. mobilizing, um, moving our faith, being bold to share our faith with our neighbor. It's not about a preacher or going to a a church. It's about taking our beliefs and like actually sharing with, again, so much love uh, so that this world will know. Well, I, I'm just astounded at what God's doing in Canada, and it's my privilege to talk to many people across this nation, and you as one of the leaders, really, in the West, I love your heart for empowering, in your case, women, but also men, to release their gifts, and here we are in COVID, and, and you had this online conference, and like 4,000 people, if you had had that in the building, what would you have had, like a couple hundred in comparison? The building that we typically use is about a thousand people okay. would fit in that building. Yeah. Um, and that's how we used to measure success, right? We would be like, wow, okay, the, no matter what the numbers are, yay, the building's full. That's what we would say would be mm-hmm. a measurement of success. But th- this was different. This was like, oh my goodness, people are watching in their living rooms and like their PJs in their bedrooms. <laughs> They're yeah. watching with by themselves, really, the most part, most of the country, you, we weren't even permitted to have a watch party right? to, you know, watch collectively with a group of friends, which could have worked, but yeah. even that was off the table. Yeah. And so we have all these people hosting watch parties online. You know, it just made us get really innovative yeah. and, and just release the content and see what people would do with it. Yeah. And you know what? God's really blessing it. And I thank you for your leadership. And I just hear in you, just like, let's each one of us step out. We don't have a building. Let's step out and do what God's called us to do wherever we are, right? Absolutely. That's it. Well, thank you, Anne, for your encouragement, for sharing more of your story. Uh, God bless you. And if you want to know more about Anne, go to 700club.ca. And now this is how John found freedom from his gambling addiction. Thanks so much, Anne. Thanks, Lori. And it was a small, tiny poker room. They might have had three or four tables. And it was like dingy and guys are smoking. It looks just like the old time movies. John Simmons still remembers the first time he walked into a casino. It was on a trip to Vegas for his 21st birthday. The guys at the table got their sunglasses on and they're bluffing each other. And it's just filling me up with all this joy. And I'm like, I love this. That was really the inception of when I decided to really pursue trying to make poker something more than just a uh, fun thing I did with friends sometimes. Back home in St. Louis, John soon became a regular at local casinos. There's no better feeling than putting a a wad of money in your pocket, knowing that you didn't do anything really to earn it. There's a lot of joy and a lot of adrenaline that pokes up in your heart. And it draws you back because the feeling of chasing that moment is intense. Gambling also filled a deeper need. Gambling gave me a sense of purpose, gave me a sense of identity, the fact that I would be a person who could be seen by others as like, oh, that guy's a multimillionaire, and all he does is play poker. He must be so good at it. Driven to become a respected poker player, John got a job at a casino as a card dealer. He made good money and was learning more about the game. If I wasn't working, I was playing. If I wasn't playing, I was sleeping. If I wasn't sleeping, I was working. I wanted to be around this thing that I loved. But Lady Luck was rarely on his side. After three years at the poker table, John was over $200,000 in debt and had to declare bankruptcy. In my mind, it wasn't that I was failing. It's I just needed to keep going. and I just needed to figure out how to fix it. If I could only win the next thing, none of these losses matter. He still had some debt after the bankruptcy, so John started working extra hours desperately trying to pay it off. But again, he dumped his money into gambling. I would spend my entire paycheck over the course of a weekend trying to chase my debts. But a lot of times I would leave zero dollars in my pocket. My mind would start to beat myself up, why'd you do that? You owe this money, you should have just paid this guy. Now you're in it so much worse. And it was just such a terrible way to live. I couldn't stop though. Hoping for a big score and chasing the illusion it was the answer to his problems, John kept betting. 
I just always thought if all I did was win, if I just win one tournament, if I win this million dollars, no one will be mad at me anymore. I'll be the person that people envy my life. For a second time, John was hundreds of thousands of dollars in debt. Now almost 30, he decided to take an honest look at his life. I finally had a realization that everything that I had tried to do wasn't working. And maybe I'm the problem. And so I decided that I was gonna to go to rehab for the first time on my own will. John started attending group therapy for those with a gambling addiction. But even after staying clean for 90 days, he still felt the burning desire to gamble. He asked his sponsor about it, who gave an answer that left John stunned. He said that you're never gonna be fixed. You're just gonna to have to learn to live a day at a time or 15 minutes at a time. And I remember thinking, that's not the life I want. You're supposed to fix me. You're not gonna fix me. If I can't get fixed, what's the point of doing any of it? With all hope gone, John went on an eight-day bender, pawning all his possessions and gambling away every last cent. I'm contemplating all these suicidal thoughts, and I'm just thinking back to my life that I've lived again. Nothing I've ever done has been worth anything. And that was very heartbreaking to me, that realization in that moment. As a last resort, John turned to God. I didn't even know who Jesus was then. You know, and I said, God, if you're real, I need you to show me a future and a hope for my life because I just don't have one anymore. I heard this voice in my head and it said, the kingdom of heaven is upon you. That meant nothing to me. That is some, I didn't understand those words in any way, shape or form. He found a Bible and started reading about Jesus in the book of Matthew. Matthew three and two, it said, repent for the kingdom of heaven is upon you. And I just froze. I was like, God is real. He's talking to me. But I was just like, God, I've messed up. I've done bad things and I don't wanna do these things anymore and I need your help and I need you to forgive me. In those moments, John committed his life to Jesus Christ. I remember the feeling of just the weight. I mean, it was so heavy on my shoulders. I've probably been there my whole life of, of just having that be released from me. It was the first time that I felt significant really significant. I felt like I was important. I had felt important in a long time. And reading the words about Jesus that he died for me, it made me feel so important. I was like, if this guy's willing to do this for me, I'm willing to live for him. In the coming months, John read his Bible and listened to sermons as often as he could. As he drew closer to God, his desire to gamble faded until God erased it and eventually it wasn't something that I did. It was God just saying, okay, I'm gonna take this off. You know, you're, you don't want it anymore. I see that you don't want it, now it's gone. John was able to pay off his gambling debts within a couple of years. Today, he has a growing family and he helps other people through his weekly radio program and podcasts. And John is quick to share that he knows he's a winner because he's loved by God. I remember getting called a loser to my face on several occasions. And having someone like Jesus in my life today, it's like truly being accepted by someone with all your warts and all your struggles and all your pain and all your bad mistakes and being saying, you know what? I still die for you. I still love you. I still care for you. You are important and significant to me because I never felt important. God can change everything. Well, what a great story of God's amazing grace. And you know what, Lori, the part that really struck me was when John said he felt like a weight had been lifted off. And I was thinking about that for all of our viewers and for myself included. I know what that's like to carry that weight of guilt and shame um, and to try to fill it with stuff that isn't going to satisfy. The, the, the Bible in Ecclesiastes says like chasing a mirage, you reach out for it, you try to grab it, but it's just a vapor. Yeah, and it's, it's a debilitating feeling, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so what have you learned about how to find that freedom? Well, and, and John, like he needed that, right? He, he had to come to the point where he was, had to admit that he was the problem. Mm. Like I can see all kinds of, in, in, when we are in debt, when, we're, when we are struggling in addiction, Sometimes the, the bottom is actually the place we say, I'm the problem, not everybody else in my life, you That's know? Good. And maybe you're watching today and you're like, man, I'm like, I gotta admit I'm the problem. But you know what made me sad is when his sponsor gave him this advice, which I think is really bad advice. He said, you're never gonna be fixed. You can only live 15 minutes at a time. Can I just say that's not from God. God whispered to him and literally said, the kingdom of heaven is upon you. So we have to ask, well, what is the kingdom of God? Well, the kingdom of God is simply where the rule and reign of the Lord Jesus are welcome. 
God is telling us to welcome his rule, welcome his reign in our life. And with that, freedom comes. Freedom that we don't just get to be free for 15 minutes at a time. We can be free from any addiction, from anything that's holding us back, completely free, no strings attached. That's why we have this resource called Free Indeed. Give us a call, 1-855-759-0700. If you want prayer from, to be freed up from anything that's weighing you down, and we'll give you this resource, and we're here to pray for you. Such a great reminder, isn't it, Bill? Well, I love what you said. It's admitting that I'm the problem, but mm -hmm. also acknowledging that God is the solution. Yes. And so that's what grace is. Grace is acknowledging, God, I need you, and you're the only one who can help me. I love that. Yeah, that's so true. And you know, it. I think for all of us, whether we hit rock bottom in a addiction scenario, we all have to admit our need for 100%. God. 100%. You're right. Yeah. And that's where we're, we're here for you. Admit your need for God. We want to pray with you. We want to encourage you. We want to help you today. So give us a call. We'll return with some hope if you're at the end of your rope. We at the 700 Club Canada believe in answered prayer, and so we want to pray for you. Write your prayer request on the back of the ornament in your mailing and return it, or submit your prayer request by going to 700club.ca. We'll display the prayer requests on our Tree of Hope. It's our joy to pray for you and your needs during this Christmas season. Do you ever feel like you've reached the end of your rope? Now, I'm completely fascinated with phrases and idioms, and so I got wondering, what exactly does that mean to be at the end of your rope? And it literally is a reference to an animal that is tethered to a pole. It means to reach the limit of your patience, your resources, your abilities, your energy, and so you're no longer able to deal with the situation. And so do you ever feel like that? I guess I got thinking about this question. What are you tied to? And do you feel trapped or stuck? Or maybe even a more important question is, how can you get free? That's what we all want, right? Freedom from the things that are holding us back. <laughs> I've been watching a lot of these videos about animals that are trapped. Don't ask me why. But I'm curious if you've ever seen these, a wild animal will be caught in like barbed wire and a good will, a hunter will come along and actually try to set them free. And what is interesting is that the harder they struggle, the harder they fight, the worse it actually gets. I got thinking about this in relation to God's grace. Ephesians 2.8 reminds us that for it is by grace you have been saved through faith. And it, this is not from yourselves. It is a gift of God, not by works. In other words, the harder you try to break free from the things that are tying you, the worse it actually gets so that no one can boast. Why? Because we are God's handiwork created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. So what does grace really mean and how can you and I find freedom in it? Well, I think the first thing is to be reminded that we have to let go. We have to let God cut the things out of our life that are literally restricting us. We got to stop fighting him and let him set us free by simply saying yes to the gift. That's grace, unmerited favor. It's a gift and all we can do in response is to say yes to the freedom that he brings by destroying the chains that tie us, the lies that hold us on the cross. And so just say yes today. The second thing I'm learning about grace is that it also means that not only am I free from the things that were holding me, now I get to tether myself to him. And that's a really good thing. I want to tell you a quick story, and I don't mean to insult anybody by the analogy, but just work with me on this. Uh, I have a, a cute little dog. Her name is Kiko. She is 15 years old. She can't really see and she can't really hear. But one of our favorite parts of the day, every day, her and I, is to go for our walk around 5.30 in the evening. And because she can't see really well or hear very well, I put her on a leash and I've taught her to heal. Now, the reason I do that is not to restrict her freedom. As a matter of fact, it's to protect her because there's this stretch of road where we have to walk on the open road. And if she wasn't tethered to me, she would literally, unfortunately, kill herself. That's the truth. So I do it because I love her. And here's the point I'm trying to make. God's grace is a gift that frees us from the things, the lies that will restrict us and ties us to the promises that will save us. So walk and experience God's grace. We'll be right back. Your CBN family has prepared something especially for you. It's a CBN family Christmas right in your own home. 
We've gathered holiday memories, miracle stories, and behind the scene glimpses with our hosts, all to bring you the warmth and love of the Christmas season. There'll be recipes and crafts, festive music, and family-friendly holiday films and concerts. Download the free CBN Family app and join your CBN family this season. Well, what a great show, Bill, and I really loved your teach. Thank you. you know, I got a dog, too. I, I know. And, and they need leashes. We need leashes. Right? Uh, what I've learned, honestly, is that when we're tied to God, yeah. His grace yeah. saves us. So good <laughs> and so true. Thank yeah. you for that. You know, we have such a privilege of doing this every day and sharing the good news of Jesus. And it's the end of the year. I mean, it's Christmas. So what better time to be thinking of giving to others for a gift of $50 or more to this ministry. We have the best thank you gift for you. It's Shannon Atchison book, Homemade Lovely. It is a gorgeous book. There's photos, there's illustrations. It's really, really practical. So anyone who's interested in decorating their home and more importantly, just committing their home to the Lord, call us at 1-855-759-0700. With your gift, we're going to send you this lovely gift. You, you want one, Bill. You want to get well, this for your wife. Okay? I do know a few people who could really use one. So yeah. I'm definitely going to pick up at least one, maybe more than one. Yes. And also during the season, we are going to be praying for people and placing uh, your prayer requests on our Christmas tree as a reminder of God's grace, His power, and that His birth really began the freedom for all of us. And so, uh, yeah, we have a couple prayer requests, Lori. Yeah, on mine, Bill, I have husband John, four-stage uh, colon cancer, okay. and another one who needs healing in their eyes, and then prayer for children and grandchildren to follow Jesus. Yeah, what a great request. I, I have one for stable housing and health during this crisis. Um, another also for Rachel and Sam, our children, yeah. uh, that they would find Christ and uh, some mental challenges there as well. And so let's just pray. Yeah. And so, Heavenly Father, thank you that we can approach your throne with confidence. Because of God, your amazing grace, and Jesus, what you did for us on the cross, we know we have access directly to one who loves us and understands us and responds. And so, God, when we find ourselves maybe uh, on the road of life, been hurt or bruised or broken, God, I thank you that you restore us by your grace and heal us. And so I pray for those requests and all the requests that have come in. God, I pray that your healing power be felt in the mighty and powerful name of Jesus. Amen and amen. Amen. Well, Hebrews 4, 16, I love this verse. Let us then approach God's throne of grace with confidence. So that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. Isn't that the gospel right there, Bill? So good. That is the grace of God in our life that we can approach him. Absolutely. And not out of fear, but out of confidence. Thank you for watching today. And please give us a call if you need prayer. To contact us, visit 700club.ca. Tomorrow on the 700 Club Canada. I don't want to live like a man. And so I started living like a woman because I thought that hiding in this identity would help me. I didn't think that the church was a place for me. 